Okay. Uh, yeah, so these are the two advertisements. The links are uh, in the email that was sent out. Please look at that. Right. In the next few uh, uh, sessions, we will have till the end of the year, we'll have three very interesting talks by Jenny, Merit, and uh, Mark on very different topics. Um, after December 6, we'll take a small break before we return on January 10th with a new uh, semester, a new season of uh, Fire to Camp Talks. And we have a very interesting lineup for the next season, next semester too. Today, I'm uh, very glad uh, to introduce Ming. Uh, Ming is an assistant professor at UCSD since uh, 2022 in the computer science and engineering department. He was a postdoctoral fellow in Peter Durstein's lab from 2017-2022 and also did his PhD in computer science and engineering at UCSD. So if you, if you felt that you've heard uh, Ming's name before, uh, you are probably correct. Uh, Ming, uh, if you have done any sort of metabolomics or use metabolomics tools, you are among these 30,000 papers that have cited Ming's work. Uh, uh, you know, he has developed, uh, has played an instrumental role in developing the GNPS uh, website, um, as well as developed several tools important for uh, analyzing metabolomics data. Uh, you know, some of the papers are listed here. Um, and these tools and resources are used in variety of ways by uh, the global metabolomics community. So along with, uh, because of this resource development, uh, you know, uh, he has held several workshops that have reached thousands of in-person attendees and over 100,000 uh, virtual attendees. Uh, his tools are accessed over 400,000 times a month, uh, which is quite impressive. And then he's a contributing member of several societies too. Uh, so uh, today he'll be talking about illuminating metabolomic dark matter and how to use and reuse big mass spectrometry data. Okay, that we stop share and Ming, you can take the stage. Thank you, Gaurav. And well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, you know, and thank you everybody for, for coming here. Uh, and hopefully, you know, I'm excited to, to speak to the, the, you know, this phytochemical audience. This is definitely um, a, a community that, that I don't, you know, work with that often, but, you know, we're making, you know, this, this is always a start. Um, so a lot of our work has been purely computational with applications to microbial work and human health work. So some of the examples are in that vein but we, I wanted to add a little bit of flair um, specifically to the phytochemicals and make it a little bit um, a little bit higher level so that you all can use your own imagination to see perhaps how it could apply to your, your own kinds of problems. So uh, feel free to ask questions definitely at the end or put them in the chat throughout this thing, um, but we'll, we'll try to keep it uh, pushed along. But anyway, um, just to recap again, my name is Ming. Um, I just started my, I'm a new faculty member, a new ish uh, at UC Riverside. Um, and, and uh, you know, I've been very fortunate the last few years and just having a great community of collaborators uh, over my career. So I just want to just say like all, all the, uh, it, we've been very fortunate. All the success has really been having great friends in the right places. So, uh, so we'll start here and here are my disclosures. Uh, and the broad area that I work at these days is this idea, this area of metabolomics. And so this is a study of these small molecules that are biochemically or biologically synthesized by some sort of organism, um, and then thinking about how it affects uh, the biology of different kinds of systems from gut, ecology, uh, you know, drug discovery, oceanography, medicine, forensics. So these are the, the broad areas um, that at least I've been uh, been able to work in and apply a lot of our computational techniques. So I want to back up for the people who are not super familiar with what metabolomics is and some of the technology, just so that we can get a little bit of uh, understanding of exactly what kind of data we're looking at and the types of questions that we try to answer. And so first, we might start with a biological sample, you know, some sort of petri dish or a tissue, 
And what are the, there's maybe hundreds of thousands to hundreds of thousands, depending on the, the complexity of the sample, of small molecules that are actually present in there. And so we want to actually start getting at this measure of what's in there and how much is in there. These are kind of two style of questions uh, that we want to we want to get at. And the technology that we use is mass spectrometry. And so at a you know at a very very high level, uh, if you're not familiar with mass spectrometry, I always envision it as a very fancy, very expensive scale. Um, and instead of weighing things like your onion, we start weighing things like uh, small molecules, like caffeine or, or some antibiotics or some sort of secondary metabolite that maybe is produced. Um, and so this is kind of the pipeline that we really kind of aspire to. Some sort of sample goes to the mass spectrometer and we just, we, we get these molecules that come out. And so the reason we chose mass spectrometry is that it's pretty high throughput. So we're talking about tens of thousands of molecules per hour. It's, it can be quantitative if we do the right thing, as well as it's very versatile instead of, and in difference from things like sequencing, which is very, very powerful, but it targets one type of biomolecule. Here in mass spectrometry, we're talking about very many different compound classes, peptides, liquid, lipids, uh, sugars, nucleic acids as well, and, and other small molecule metabolites are all within reach um, if you have the right type of mass spectrometer. Um, and so here, if we, show on the right hand side, if we weigh a particular molecule, this happens to be caffeine, we can see that it weighs 195 Daltons. And this is just simply the summation of the, the masses uh, of the individual atoms that go into the 2D structure. But one of the problems that arises if we purely just weigh the whole molecule is there may be two different isomers that result in the exact same mass. And if you just weigh them, they're indistinguishable. So we can see here on the left and, and the right hand side. And so we have to do a little bit extra if we really want to get down to the 2D structure and get more details other than simply having a molecular formula. And so understanding 2D structure is one of the keys to understanding function and biosynthesis and a lot of downstream reasoning about uh, chemistry. And so the way we approach this problem in mass spectrometry is we use a technique called a tandem mass spectrometry. And so instead of simply weighing the molecule, we of course weigh the molecules to, fit, to at least figure out the molecular composition, but then we also add a little bit of energy and we break the molecule into smaller pieces. And so to a first approximation, there are stronger and weaker bonds within these molecules. Uh, when you apply some energy, the weaker bonds break first, and then you end up with uh, distinct pieces. And so what we can do now is we go back to the mass spectrometer and you know, we have a fancy way to measure masses, we can measure the masses of the pieces. And so by measuring the mass of the pieces, what we can visualize here is on the x-axis, the mass, uh, the mass range, on the y-axis, the relative uh, proportion that we see these pieces. And so to us, this provides a unique signature uh, that, and we will talk about the relative uniqueness a little bit later, but this is a unique fingerprint for this particular molecule that we measured analytically in the mass spectrometer. And so just to kind of recap how all this is together, we have a full molecule, we weigh, it, we weigh the intact molecule without breaking it into pieces, and we call this the precursor mass. Uh, and we measure that you know, at some number of Daltons. We fragment it, and then we end up with a set of masses that are the, the fragment pieces. And so, uh, and at least in computer science terms, we, we have this is a set of tuples, of mass and intensity. And what we call this is the tandem mass spectrum or the MS-MS spectrum or the MS-2 spectrum. So this is generally synonymous if you're, uh, if you get into this kind of area. So instead of, you know, when we apply mass spectrometry practically in the real world for metabolomic samples, again, we start off with a biological sample. We subject it to mass spectrometry and tandem mass spectrometry analysis. And instead of getting out structures, we get out tens of thousands of tandem mass spectra for all these different molecules that are in our sample. So that's, that's getting us part of the way there uh, to the goal that we set out at the very beginning. So uh, that's, that's, that's where our story starts um, at the very least. And so ultimately what we wanna do, kind of bringing it back to the beginning, is that we want to be able to turn these tandem mass spectra that we measure on the mass spectrometer back into the structures again, so we can start reasoning about it. Because this is something uh, the chemistry field is, you know, a little bit more uh, 
able to have a handle on. And so just to give us an idea of where we're at within the field. So when we started, when I was doing my PhD 10, 15 years ago, I started my PhD, uh, we were really at identification rates of tandem mass spectrometry in the less than 1%. So just this is kind of a plot uh, we, we drew up a, a few years ago, just charting our progress. So back in 2014, almost nothing. And then slowly over time, we were able to grow and build new tools, build new databases, grow this annotation rate. And then we're, you know, to depending on how you measure it, we're in you know the, the 10 to 15%. And here we, we measured it to about 13% today. And so the way that we actually achieve this is what we're gonna talk, is, is the, the outline of this the talk here today. Um, and so just to give us a little schematic of how we're gonna think about the approaches uh, that, that are gonna be relevant, we can draw this big oval in gray that denotes all the public tandem mass spectrometry experiments that are available uh, that have been deposited for public, you know, public sharing. And so that's you know about a billion tandem mass spectra, tandem mass spectra. Actually, these days it's maybe closer to two billion, but it's it's on that order. And so we're going to see how did we how were we able to identify the known compounds, which is about somewhere between five and fifteen percent, as highlighted here in this uh, yellow section. How could we computationally start expanding this, taking iterative steps to expand? from known to slightly unknown space, as well as how can we start uh, understanding these bigger islands of new novel chemistry across all of this public uh, mass spectrometry data. And so this is generally the outline that we're gonna talk about. Again, identifying known compounds, propagating from unknown to unknown to start expanding that knowledge. And then the last two sections are, how do we really start taking advantage of this public data to start making it useful and start mining it uh, in, in clever and intelligent ways. So to start at the very top of identifying the known molecules, uh, one of the, uh, the broad approaches that uh, we want to be able to do is given an unknown query spectrum that comes out of the mass spectrometer you know, within, you know, within a few seconds, we want to be able to turn that into a structure. Now, Today, we're, we're making a little bit of headway here, but in general, it's not very good. The limitation for doing this is that we don't actually have a way to take a structure, a 2D chemical structure, and predict in, in, in a, with a high confidence uh, the fragmentation of it. So this is actually still quite difficult within the metabolomics field. And so what we've uh, done historically in the last 10, 15 years is, OK, well, we don't try to solve that problem. We try to sidestep it and say, well, if there is a molecule that we've discovered before and that we've measured uh, in tandem mass spectrometry, we can save that into a library. You know, we remember that we don't need to reuse this, uh, redo this work and we can reuse that data so that if there's a new tandem mass spectrum that comes along, we can say, hey, is this similar to something we've seen before? And if it is, and it's sufficiently similar, we can say, okay, we think that the same molecule is the same analytical entity. We can look up what, what, the, what the chemical structure was and say, my new compound that I just measured is probably that structure because it looks identical to something in the library. And so you, the problem of, uh, about 10, 15 years ago was that the libraries were very, very small. There was no incentive or infrastructure to really make these libraries big and have the community contribute. Um, and so that's what we built, and we borrowed some ideas from kind of the two biggest uh, uh, community-driven resources out at the time. PDB for the life sciences, for those who are unfamiliar, it's a deposition of uh, uh, structures for proteins. Um, and Wikipedia, it's something we're all kind of familiar with. Um, and so we, we borrowed a page out of their book, and what we've enabled is for anybody in the community to start depositing their tandem mass spectra that they've solved the structure either by running standards of known compounds, or they took the laborious work of purifying a compound, solving it with orthogonal techniques like NMR, and then they were publishing it as well as depositing it um, in, a, in a resource, one of the resources would be called GMPS. And so over the last 10-ish uh, years, uh, we've been able to grow from just a few thousand tandem mass spectra to over 600,000 
uh, tandem mass spectra in these libraries that are available for uh, public consumption. And so that was pretty exciting. But one of the, the questions that we, uh, you know, that de definitely dogged uh, Wikipedia in the early days is how can you trust just randos, uh, you know, on the internet to give you good quality, you know, knowledge, uh, and in this case, spectra and uh, MSMS spectra. And so what we did was we actually, we, we conducted an experiment and it's still, people can still engage in this, is we made putative identifications to all the public data that was out there. So at the time it was about, you know, a thousand or 2000 public data sets. And uh, what we did was once we had those putative identifications where we took the library and said, and annotated this public data, we went back to the data contributors who actually deposited the data, who would know the data best and asked them, what do you think? Are these identifications for your compounds in your data sets correct using this publicly uh, curated uh, spectral library resource? And so we asked them to rate something from one to four stars being cor from correct, incorrect uh, to fully correct. And so what we found was these GMPS collections here on the left two columns, they had at least uh, as good ratings uh, as other resources that were you know, for sale or being you know, curated by a single entity. And the, the basis of comparison for us is right next to it's called, it's from the National Institute of Standards and Technology from the US Department of Commerce. And so this is a, uh, a library that is created by them. And so as you can see here in yellow, the ratings were as good or better than that. So that was that gave us confidence that the community was able to build a library and create a resource that could be used and was trustworthy to actually make annotations and, and kind of push uh, this problem uh, a little bit forward. So where did that bring us, right? So that allowed us to get, you know, looking at this in 2022, that brought us from less than 1%, and it was far, far less than 1%. So I don't want to talk about full changes, but um, but that got us to about four percent identification rate with this crowdsourcing approach. Huge improvements, uh, but still, that told us there is so much of these uh, MSMS spectra that we can't identify that could be impactful, right? So we want to really start uh, moving the you know, it's not really scalable, not a scalable way to reach a hundred percent. Uh, if it took us 10 years to get to 4% in, in this sort of fashion, even though uh, it was a big improvement. And so here we want to address this issue about maybe we can think about using what we know and start slowly expanding instead of simply re-identifying the exact known compound that we saw before, maybe we can think about some local neighborhood where we can propagate some near, near neighbors or very similar molecules. And so that is what allows us broadly to see the step step function jump from 4% to 13% as kind of a, a teaser here. And so I want to give us all a little intuition about the underlying premise of what drives this particular approach. And so you can imagine two chemical structures here on the on the on the top here on the left and the right. And they're nearly identical, except there's an extension of this lipid tail uh, on uh, extension on the right hand on the molecule on the right hand side is stenothricin C. And so this happens to be an antibiotic that we discovered a few years ago. And so the bottom line is these have similar structure. And so when you put these two molecules into the mass spectrometer for tandem mass uh, fragmentation, we can think about, well, what's going to happen? How do the relative bond strengths compare between these two molecules? What will the tandem mass spectra look like? And what is the relationship between the two, the two tandem mass spectra? And so broadly, what we can see here is in some kind of limited cases or some set of cases, but it's big enough to be useful, if they have similar structure, they will yield similar tandem mass spectrometry fragmentation. And so generally, kind of if you squint your eyes a little bit, don't look at the masses too much. We'll explain that in a little second. But the broad shape of the intensity of the peaks and where they appear, they're very similar. But what we can start doing is we can start teasing out these differences and account for these differences and in, in, in a computational fashion. And so here's a little toy example to remove the complexity of, of a real molecule. 
And so on the top, we have one molecule. On the bottom, we have that same molecule, except we add a little bit of a delta structure here on the right-hand side. So maybe apologies to, to the chemist drawing, drawing it like this. But the idea here, the, what we want to convey is if you fragment the top molecule and the bottom molecule at the same relative position drawn by this blue dashed line, what you end up with in common between the two molecules is this orange fragment. It's highlighted in the circle orange, as well as represented in the tandem mass spectrum on the left-hand side. They'll be at the exact same mass because those fragments, or that specific fragment, does not contain the change in structure. It does not contain the delta. Second is we'll notice on the, the complementary side of that blue fragmentation line, on the top molecule, it generates a fragment highlighted in purple. So that's the mass of that particular substructure in purple. But on the bottom, instead, we don't see a purple, or at least the, we don't draw a purple circle. We see a blue circle drawn. And it weighs more because it includes what was in the purple plus a, that delta structure. And so what we can see in the tandem mass spectrum, how it's reflected, is there is now a blue peak that's at a shift uh, to the right, which means it's, it's a greater in mass relative to the purple peak in the first molecule. So this is the kind of the key insight on how these two tandem mass spectra will differ based upon a difference in the, uh, the uh, original structures. And so what we can start thinking about doing is we can start considering all possible alignments between the first spectrum of the first molecule and the second spectrum of the second molecule. And we happen to know what the delta could be uh, just because we can weigh the whole molecule and simply the difference between the, in, the full weights of the molecules is that mass of the delta. And so what we can consider is for every peak in the top spectrum, so for example, the orange peak, it could either be at the same mass or to shift the delta. Similar for the purple peak, it could be at a, the same mass or a shift of the delta. And we computationally can consider all possibilities of these alignments in order to account for potential shifts and score the top molecule spectrum against the bottom molecule spectrum. And then if they are similar, we can infer and, 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 and predict that we think they also have similar structure because they have similar tandem mass spectrometry. So that's the bottom line intuitive idea of what, what we're, we're positing here for similar structures. Now, one of the things that that limits us in this particular case of this, the way we formulate this kind of computational problem is that it really only works if there's a single structural modification. Because we look at the, the delta between the full, full molecules and we say, well, there's a single structural modification. It becomes significantly more difficult to try to consider, well, what if there's two, three, four, and, and so on. And so in this original formulation of the problem, we can only account for a single structural modification. But if there's two molecules that differ by, in this particular case, we can see on the right, right hand side, it's a double modification on distal parts of the structure where there's a delta and gamma. Our formulation cannot align this. But for, for in, in, in our case, uh, biology generally offers us a solution just because multiple modifications don't happen all that often atomically or kind of small together. And so what we can do is we all usually observe an intermediate bridging molecule. So if there are two different modifications from the left all the way to the right, we usually see an intermediate that has at least one of the modifications. And because of that, we can start connecting everything together using all the, all the molecules in a particular sample and bridging everything together. And so what we kind of term this is you can use this transitivity idea uh, to, to tie everything together. And we can scale this sort of uh, alignment between all molecules to all tandem mass spectra that we detect in an experiment. So we can figure out all, it allows us to fill in all intermediates that are present, that are actually present in the data. And so just to give you an idea, this, uh, this leads us to this particular concept, concept of molecular networking. 
Um, and so this happens to be a, an, an application of that. But what I want to highlight here is the way we actually start visualizing these things is on this left-hand side is an example of small molecular network where every circle represents a molecule that we detected in the sample and a, a connection uh, represents a, what we think is a significant alignment between two tandem mass spectra, which we hypothesize as a single structural modification between those two molecules. And you can see that it's larger than just one hop between molecules. And so this, you know, you can travel up and down this whole network, it may be four or five hops. And so the power of the molecular network is that it can bring together uh, very similar molecules that may differ by several different modifications because it can bridge these small connections into a bigger network that can be explored. And so just to highlight one particular example, we published a paper a few years ago, um, and the lead author was Robbie Quinn, and we were able to, the, the study was looking at what are the unique molecules made by the microbiome in mice. But the bottom line here is we were able, so this is a figure created by Emily Gentry, we were able to look, zoom in on one part of the particular molecular network, identify one, only one member of this entire family of molecules. And so this happens to be a bioelastic glycocholic acid. And then because the network brought these uh, other molecules together that we didn't know what they were and weren't identified, but because it allowed us to prioritize and, and, and we formulated this problem in such a way, Emily was able to start propagating annotations manually from glycocholic acid to other bioelastic conjugated amino acids. And so we're moving around this network and putatively identifying new uh, structural analogs that had not been dis discovered before. And so this, this is a reasonably impactful. So they were fortunate to uh, publish um, both the protocols and a, a kind of a nature paper out of that. So anyway, I didn't do much of the biology work. That's all on them. But the bottom line here is because the networks brought everything together, they were able to prioritize new structural analogs very, very quickly and solve these structures by carefully analyzing the mass spectrometry manually. And so that's still a step in the right direction for discovery and prioritization and understanding what chemical diversity may exist uh, in, in your metabolomic samples. But what was deeply unsatisfying to me is that uh, these chemists, they had to do this manually. It was, it, it, it kind of hurts me as a computer science that we, scientist that we couldn't automate this particular uh, approach. And so one of the, one of the uh, papers that we published recently uh, to uh, automate this particular problem so chemists have to do less work is that if we have a known compound in the molecular network and there are neighbors that are putative structural analogs, what we can start thinking about is uh, actually solving the structure of those putative analogs. And the way that we formulate this problem is we call this a site localization uh, approach. And so just to give you an idea about the intuition here is you have this known structure here on the le top left-hand side, and maybe there's a methylation reaction or there's a methylated version of this particular metabolite that we, you, you see in the molecular networks. Now, we know there's a methyl group that appears somewhere, and, but as and shown in this toy example, it can appear any place kind of cycled around this molecule. And so there's many, many different possibilities on where that methylation site could have been on this particular uh, uh, relative to the known structure. And so our goal here, and we've defined this as a, a computational problem, is saying, OK, we know there's a methylation, but we just need to know where on which specific atom of the known compound this methylation actually, where it actually occurs. And so we introduced a new approach. It's called ModiFinder. And so the idea, and just kind of giving you a little bit of intuition, the idea and how we actually achieve this is we carefully analyze the difference between the known tandem mass spectrum and the unknown tandem mass spectrum. And so the, the, our insight is that if the peak shifts, that means whatever fragment, whatever substructure in the original molecule that appeared in, that must be where the modification actually appears. 
And so we can carefully think if it shifted, one of the atoms in that particular peak must contain a modification. If it didn't shift, it should not. It's an exclusion criteria. And so using this careful analysis, we can think about there are multiple sites that could appear, but given the tandem mass spectra, we can, we can say it's one of those with higher confidence. And so again, this is a toy example, but when we look at something a little bit, you know, a little bit more complicated uh, as a structure, just to give you intuition, if we can say that this region on the left-hand side, which is highlighted in blue, there's a, the peak A says that it'll appear somewhere in that blue circle. If there's another peak B that is shown in green on the right-hand side, the modification will appear somewhere in that blue purple. Our approach, this modifier approach, figures out that intersection. And then that's where we predict the, the modification site to be. So the, the implementation details, are nothing works quite this nicely uh, most of the time in the real world. But this in, in, it is uh, how we've thought about uh, and developed this particular solution. So that's one way that we've helped to automate uh, annotation of unknown molecules that are very close to this known chemical space. Now, what we want to do once we're armed with this idea of molecular networking, we're armed with this idea of a MADI finder, what we want to think about doing is we want to scale this up. That's kind of uh, what we, it's always fun to think in, in those terms. And so we have all this public data available to us that's been deposited. Again, thousands of metabolomics data sets. And we wanted to ask the question, well, if we uh, took these approaches and we really scaled this up to create molecular networks across all data, how many putative neighbors could we start annotating with very high confidence? And so this is a collaboration um, with Wout. He's now a professor at the University of Antwerp. And so uh, he was able uh, to take all these data sets and create a, a massive global molecular network across thousands of data sets. And this is about you know, 60 terabytes of raw data, huge, huge thing. And so what we were able to do here is given the about 1.1 billion public tandem mass spectra, we were able to confidently uh, uh, propagate from known to unknown about 88,000 new uh, new molecules, right? new putative neighbors um, that we were able to contribute back to the MSMS spectral libraries. And what was the net result of this? This allowed us to grow from the 4% that we saw up to 13%. So a pretty big boost. It's, it's one path forward that allows us to significantly amplify the impact of any single contribution from the community of a known molecule, and that it, it, it brings it one ring out. So that's one of the approaches that we think is, is, is pretty good. Um, and it resulted, a 15% growth in the libraries resulted in about a 400% increase in annotation rate. So that's not, that's not bad. Um, and that's, that's something that we update reasonably regularly. Um, and so hopefully that, that kind of pushes the needle forward for the, for the rest of the community. And so that's that limits that that ends this portion about propagating from known to unknown. But as we tease in this end of this last section, we really want to think about how can we better use this public data to really start making better sense of these metabolomics results. Um, and we saw it from an annotation perspective, but we're also seeing it. We're going to talk, shift gears and talk about uh, how we can think about it from contextualizing our data and, and just mining it in general in the last two points here. And just to give you an idea where we are as a community and how much public data we have, and this is a graph from about 2014 to 2020, we, we had very, very little data in 2014 before we actually built uh, a lot of the repository infrastructure uh, during the late years of my PhD. And so just to give us an all an idea, Today we're sitting at you know 60 to 80 terabytes. Kind of we we, we need to update some of these charts, um, but 60 to 80 terabytes of public metabolomics data across three repositories around the world. So one at UCSD, actually two at UCSD, um, and one at, in the UK uh, called Metabolite, sponsored by the EBI. And so we have all this data just kind of sitting there. 
And so we really want to start making use of it because it presents a unique opportunity for us. And so we take a page out of uh, what the sequencing community has done. And so people deposit uh, data at uh, NCBI, they deposit data um, uh, at the EDI. And so what do people do once, once they actually, how do you make use of all this data out there? And so I think a lot of us are familiar with tools like BLAST, right? We want to take a DNA sequence and we can ask, uh, you know, with a web interface or some command line tools, given all this sequencing data, where have I found exactly this molecule? Where have I found some putative uh, analog DNA sequences that might have similar function from homology? Um, but we want to do this very easily, very quickly, and very scalably. So that's kind of the, the hallmark of these this class of tool that was uh, really spearheaded by BLAST in the 90s. And so in parallel to, to BLAST, how we want to view it, we created a tool called MASS. So this is the, the MASS Spectrometry Search Tool as a, as a fun acronym. And so in parallel, instead of taking a DNA sequence, we take a tandem mass, a tandem mass spectrum, and we can ask a similar question. Where have we seen this exact tandem mass spectrum in the raw data? And you, we can also ask similar questions about uh, putative analogs uh, with the same kind of formulation that we did with uh, uh, with the molecular networking paradigm. And so the the bottom line here is we can do this today, and we published a paper back in 2020 that shows how to do this. Um, but the, specifically for this talk, what I want to emphasize is if you take a tandem mass spectrum and you query it across all this billion uh, data that we've indexed, and we can search very very quickly and we've done some algorithmic innovations to make that happen, we run to another roadblock because there's hundreds of thousands of samples that we can tell you, hey, your tandem mass spectrum, which represents a molecule you care about, has been matched to you know, these thousand uh, actual samples that somebody else has collected. Now, you're given back a set of file names, and it's just not useful. You have no idea what any of this means in terms of a biological, experimental, or uh, you know, taxonomic context. And so driven by this sort of need, uh, Wender Gomez, he was a postdoc at UCSD, and so this is, we, this is under review right now. He took it upon himself to, to do this project called Plant Mast. And so this is a plant-specific version that enhances the mass database. And the specific direction that this enhances mass is by doing the meticulous work of curating the metadata at a per sample basis, understanding what types of uh, instrumentation it was collected under, what types of extraction, instrument chromatography. And more importantly, he also went back in and figured out the taxonomic uh, context of every single sample that he could. And so this resulted in about 19,000 uh, plant extracts having an actual species, genera, family label uh, on them. And so this is a first step effort uh, to making all this data more useful for the plant community. Uh, but going from almost nothing to you know almost 20,000, that's a, a big step in the right direction. This is only possible uh, because Wender was able to mobilize the broader uh, community to start actually annotating their own data as well as other papers in the field. And so you can see this worldwide uh, network of people where they, you know, they were willing to contribute to this, this resource that is publicly available. And so just to give you an idea of some of the things that you can do with this uh, you can take a particular molecule. So this is a, a figure from the paper. You're able to take one particular molecule that you care about. So these happen to be known molecules that we have. That we know who produces them and, and to some extent, um, their function. And uh, so you can see these cannabinoids uh, as one example. We can ask, where has this actually been uh, been produced and is, is uh, available in the public data in this line two and line eight as THC. And it finds it in, unsurprisingly, the cannabis plant. But we can also see these other bioactive compounds like dopamine, GABA, serotonin. And we can see those molecules or some sort of isomer in quite a bit uh, of different plants um, in, in this particular context. And now you can ask this of specific molecules that you know of, 
But more interestingly, you can ask this question within your own samples. I have a new putative unknown metabolite. Is it found in other plants? So that might tell you the prevalence and the production across other genuses. But also from a, a purification perspective, you can perhaps find a more readily accessible uh, uh, organism where you can purify that particular uh, metabolite out and solve its structure, if that's, that's something that's interesting um, to you all. And so just to kind of plug this a little bit more, uh, this particular paper is under review. It's live um, as a preprint if you're interested, but more importantly for, for this community, if you actually want to use plant mast, uh, the address is here. Go ahead and play, play with it. Put your uh, tandem mass spec in if you have tandem mass spec data, um, and you can search any of these molecules within a few seconds and get this sort of contextualization. And so the final piece that I want to want to say is uh, we just talked about how we can use this public data to give, build some context, but also how can we start using this public data very, very explicitly to mine for new chemistry that may be out there. And so to bring it back to this particular view, uh, we had this small island of known molecules, but there's all this extra chemistry out there that we hypothesize is ripe for discovery. And so how do we hone in on exactly what matters for your particular biological or biochemical question in order to explore what's relevant? And so to motivate this problem, you know, in the, the right before um, I went to uh, UC Riverside as my, uh, to start my own faculty uh, career. Uh, Peter and I work very well together at UCSD uh, because Peter is a mass spectrometrist and a chemist that is who's incredibly creative. And my background is uh, computer science. Um, and so it's just kind of that intersection uh, has enabled a lot of innovation. And so, you know, we were just chatting one of these days and he was, you know, musing, well, we have all this public data, right? And he was just thinking, well, could we look for all carnitine? And so he was just, he was thinking from a, uh, from a mammalian perspective. And so, uh, you know, I know a little bit about uh, analytical chemistry. I know a little bit about mass spectrometry and a little bit know about, you know, structures in general. And I thought to myself, well, one thing that I know is that certain features of molecules will yield certain unique patterns in a tandem mass spec or in, in the mass spectrometry data in general. So for example, specific uh, atoms will have unique isotopic signatures. Certain unique structural moieties will yield patterns, distinctive patterns in the tandem mass spec data. And so for carnitines, I was able to reason, well, I know carnitines have a quaternary amine, and I just happen to know that there's a neutral loss of uh, 60 and a peak of 85 in the tandem mass spec. So that's something, you know, kind of domain knowledge that I will have. And what I can think about is, well, what I can do is I can take that knowledge, write a very simple piece of software that looks exactly for that pattern, very bespoke piece of software, scale this up, search this against all the public data out there, do some high throughput data engineering and search through 50 terabytes of data. We can obviously do this. And, but once you accomplish this, you, there's a there's a saying in 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 in, in uh, the U.S. If you give a if you give a mouse a, a cookie, they want a glass of milk, right? So the chemist will say, "Well, great, you did that. That's fine. Now my imagination is going to run wild. I want I care about thinking about brominated compounds. I care about sideropores, saccharides, peptidic natural products, drug metabolism products, bile acids. There, it's just a never-ending list. And so me being a lazy computer scientist, I don't really want to do anything. I don't want to kind of entertain those new uh, new queries that they want to do with my effort. We want to automate all this. And so the question that arises is, can we think of a universal computational solution that is able to empower chemists to answer these questions without having to talk to me, right? So that's kind of the, the charge that it, of the similar style that, that, that I happen to pop. And so we think that this is possible. We, we think we can come up with a solution that's possible. And so one of the, the one idea and the, the infrastructure that we built out to try to solve this is we, we invented a new language called the mass spec query language. And so just to kind of 
go through the, the kind of high level pillars of how we thought about designing this is number one, it needs to be understandable by chemists, right? So if that's target audience, they need to be able to read it and write in this particular language. It needs to be flexible. It needs to express in a domain specific way, again, so it's accessible, all the, all the complexity for mass spectrometry, retention time, mobility, all these sorts of patterns to start querying the data in the exact amount of uh, power that chemists actually want. Number three, it needs to be scalable. It doesn't help that you can search one spectrum. For us, we care about this repository scale, so we need to scale this up uh, and enable to terabytes and terabytes of data. And finally, if you take the time to write something as language, it needs to be reusable. So if somebody takes the effort to write something in MassQL, it should be shareable and reusable and be an effective form of technology transfer uh, between people within a lab and across a community um, so that it's computable the moment you read that in somebody else's manuscript. And so tackling these first two ideas of understandability and flexibility, for those of you who are mass spec nerds, I just want to give you a high level idea of what's possible. You can look for specific masses. You can look for losses from neutral, from uh, the neutral losses from precursor. You can look at gaps between peaks. You can look at relative peak intensities. And this is, again, a very small uh, cross section of what you can do, but it, it gets, gives you an idea of the syntax uh, as well as some of the power. And beyond that, you can combine all of these in arbitrary complexity with and or, or conjugations. So it gives you that sort of flexibility. But if also at the same time, it, to, if you don't want to actually learn the syntax, it's OK. Uh, one of the key innovations that came about since we invented the language is these large language models have become very, very good. And so we have a, a, a GPT. Uh, we we, we uh, taught GPT MassQL specifically. And now you can just interact with it as a chatbot writing prose in English. And then it'll give you a MassQL query that you can use uh, immediately that comes out. And so just giving a quick uh, highlight of when this can be used. And so this is a, this is work done by a collaborator, Daniel Petras at UC Riverside. And so during his PhD, he was he really cared about a class of natural products called albicidin. And so this is the NRPS PKS hybrid natural product. And he happened to know that this particular natural product always yielded distinctive fragmentation at 468 and 660 M over Z. And so he was able to codify that as a masculine query in a few minutes. And he was able to research the data that he had used that he published back in 2017. And so within a few minutes, applying MassQL, he was number one able to recapitulate known compounds that he had discovered by manual analysis back in 2017, in, again, in a few minutes. But because MassQL was fast and comprehensive, he was able not only to discover his molecules, but when we visualized it in a molecular network, highlighted in gray here, new putative albicidins that he had missed in his own data uh, back then. And so this is an example of where being comprehensive and enabling automation can really accelerate and be uh, more powerful in terms of discovery over your own manual analysis. And so another thing I want to point out is in terms of scalability. So that was a small data set of a few, a few dozen data files. And so it wasn't particularly big. And so recently, we were fortunate to publish a paper uh, in Cell that explored this uh, underappreciated, undiscovered wealth of bile acid uh, diversity. And so again, this is this happens to be in the mammalian space, but you can imagine a very similar thing in the plant space. And so this was uh, done by Ipsita, who's a postdoc at UCSD, and she was able to think about, well, I know she knows a little bit about bile acids, and she formulated a query that was very specific for bile acids. So we can see here, or for a particular type of bile acid, here was trihydroxyl bile acid, and she had a family of queries that she, she coded um, in MassQL. And then so she was able to write this query, and she was able to take over 100 million tandem mass spectra from public repositories, apply this trihydroxyl bile acid, and find distilled down and reduced by three orders of magnitude down to 270,000 tandem mass spect, mass spect that you know, met that particular criteria. And so doing further processing by uh, merging identical spectra and organizing as a molecular network, she was able to 
start teasing, ap uh, uh, teasing apart all the different novel bile acids that this MassQL and, the, and this public mass spectrometry data was telling her. And so the net result that we claim in this paper is there were about 97 known bile acid modifications uh, that were published in the literature. But by mining the public data in this high throughput way and grouping it together and summarizing it, we could observe thousands of observed modifications in the tandem mass spectra where we were confident these were bile acids, but the modifications were new. Um, so definitely uh, that was exciting that we were able to amplify and grow this, uh, you know, this, this space of chemical diversity that is the foundation for new biological hypotheses that people can take and it's all as an open resource and identify and figure out these new novel structures uh, within this bile acids you know, subspace. So that was exciting and that demonstrates how we were able to scale up MassQL. And just as, a, uh, as an aside, Ipsita is a brilliant scientist, but she's not a computational scientist. And so she's, she's more of an analytical scientist, but because MassQL, we've engineered it and we've designed it in such a way, it was very accessible for her to do everything without having to talk to me, which was amazing. So if you wanted to use MassQL today, where could you do it? And so we try to integrate it into the wider metabolomics ecosystem. And if you're a bioinformatician, you can have, there's an R and a Python interface to it, but also it's integrated in some of the most popular uh, metabolomics software out there. So things like MS Dial, OpenMS, uh, MZMind, GMPS, uh, as well as commercial offerings. Um, today it's offered directly in Metaboscape from Bruker, if you're, if you're familiar with that. So ultimately, at the end of the day, with MassQL and through carrying us through these vignettes, I could, you know, we, we were confident to think that we could develop a universal computational solution that was accessible by chemists to mine their own and public data without having to involve, uh, you know, computational scientists to kind of uh, navigate uh, the complexities of the big data analysis for them. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, at the end of this talk, we're able to think about what we covered is we have this big ocean of detected analytes by mass spectrometry. We were able to, through crowdsourcing, annotate the known group. So we have this core unit of knowledge that we can annotate. We were able to use this molecular networking paradigm to start expanding this knowledge. And then ultimately with things, tools like MAST and MASQL, we were able to take advantage of uh, all this unknown space that is not really close to uh, these known molecules and figure out uh, what signals, what analytes, and what putative structures may be uh, informative and interesting for your particular hypothesis. And just some I examples that we're working on, things like aminoglycoside antibiotics, sideriforms, again, this is more on the gut so side, maybe there's some sort of metabolism from xenobiotics for humans, but also you can imagine there's some uh, novel chemistry for on, the, on, the, on the plant side, the phytochemical side, um, as well as uh, for, for human health, environmental pollutants uh, that may be metabolized or at least in, in, in present in uh, human. And ultimately, uh, this is all this work is hugely collaborative across multiple stages of my career. Uh, so people at UC San Diego, UC Santa Cruz, uh, and the CU Anschutz, as well as close collaborators at the DOE, specifically the Joint Genome Institute and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, as well as uh, a lot of my mentees uh, that do the actual work. And obviously the funding is definitely a key portion to, to push forward um, all this sort of analysis. And definitely this whole world of collaborators that you know I was very fortunate early in my career, um, people outside of you know, my, my, my tight circle, they were willing to use my tools when they were not so great. Um, but their feedback and their contributions really uh, significantly improve them. And so uh, together, uh, we've been able to build this whole software ecosystem of analysis that, uh, you know, we hope to keep improving and keep building on. So again, thank you all for, uh, for listening and, and, and coming to this talk and happy to take questions um, after this. Thanks, Ming. That was excellent. Uh, 
if you have any questions, already people are putting them in chat and uh, you can raise your hand. So let's start with Jen. Hi, May. Excellent talk. This is Jen from uh, SUNY Buffalo. Uh, my question is, how, like in the molecular network, you can I, elucidate the structures um, of the unknown metabolites. How do how can how can you convince the chemists that the structure, the new structure, is correct without authentic standards and right. NMR right. data? That's my right. First so question. yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, let's take let's take it one at a time. Um, so because that's a very good question. So especially when you you got to convince yourself first, right? Like that you're not publishing BS, right? But I think some of the things that uh, you have to, it's it's a lot a lot about the wording. So there's in the metabolome standards initiative, there's different levels of identification confidence, right? As you're saying, level one, you have an authentic standard or you purified and installed by NMR. So if you're making that sort of claim, you should titrate based upon what sort of analytical evidence you have. So that's kind of number one, how do you frame your claim, right? So that's, that's number one. Um, beyond that, within the molecular networks, if you have a putative neighbor, so with the Modi finder approach, it tries to mechanistic, there's some, to show the alignment, it shows like, we think that this peak is the substructure. And so that's a way to convince yourself, number one. And then you reflect that back when you write the paper, you wanna talk about specific mass spectrometry mechanisms. And so that's a way to get to a more confident putative identification that you can say, look, it's a level three identification. We know that, but this is a pretty good hypothesis. It's definitely not these other regioisomers. So that's kind of how I would couch it. But the caveats here really come down to, and, and it's a limitation from the Modi finder side, but it's fundamentally a limitation of mass spectrometry. You don't actually have that much information in the tandem mass spectrometry. So, or you can, in some cases, you won't have very much information. So you can imagine if there's only a single peak, like what are you supposed to do? Like, even if you knew exactly how the fragmentation mechanism worked, it's just not enough information for you to figure these things out. So you can go back and you add more energy and to do more fragmentation. But fundamentally, when you think about it yourself, you may just be limited by the amount of information that's just present in the data that you collected. So that's unfortunate, but that's that's kind of the reality that you live in. So one of the things that we do on the ModiFinder side is we have a little predictor, we're trying to improve it, but it tries to predict the confidence of the annotation. And one of the things that we do is we look at the number of peaks. One of the inputs to the model is how many peaks that you actually fragment, how ambiguous is the explanation of the peaks. And so these are kind of proxies that you probably would use as a chemist as well to think how good, how much can I trust this? Um, just because you can imagine if you don't do any fragmentation, well, you're definitely screwed, right? So that, that's one way to think about it. So. Yeah, the confidence score will really help. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't buy, it's like, it's very simple. So I would always like hark it back to like analytical first principles of like, how much ambiguity is there? What are the alternatives and things like that? But it helps you all prioritize putatively more important, you know, what we think would be more confident to start there, right? But you don't want to stop with saying, hey, Ming's thing said 99%, so it's got to be right. So I don't want to, don't don't stop there. So is 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 kind of my, I would posit that right. Any thoughts on stereochemistry of uh, molecules? Uh, so that's an area. So if it's uh, if it's enantiomers, I think in general, unless you're doing something very careful from a chromatography perspective, I say forget about it. Um, don't try to make an enantiomer based uh, claim. But if it's diastereomer, then you will start seeing shifts in even non-chiral columns. So there, you'll probably have to run standards to confirm which one it is. Um, and they'll also fragment differently based upon that. So I would be pretty careful if you can just drop the wedges. So, um, but this is something. Um, it's kind of an open problem, uh, at least from a high throughput perspective. Of course, yeah, you can do detailed, uh, you can do these other follow-up and analytical things, um, but from a computational perspective, it's still kind of an open problem. For us, at the very least, we wanna frame some of these questions for the modification site localization 
we just are at least stopping one one level short and just trying to say, look, there's going to be ambiguity in the regio isomers. That's at least where we're sitting in terms of that computational problem. So talking about stereochemistry, that's just making it even harder. It's a good question to ask, um, but at least from our tools perspective, it's just quite not, not there yet. Thank you very much. So there is a question in the chat, but I'm not sure if it's the same uh, as what Jen asked. Uh, Carlos, do you want to elaborate? Yes, uh, can you, you can me? take the question if you want. Yes, yeah, basically, if you run any kind of benchmarking uh, or the calculation of, of, of how good is it that pre-calling, like taking some standards out of your uh, data set and then see if you can recall them to, to, to get more, more or less like an idea of how much you can recall of, of, of the modifications. Like if you have right, a standard right. so, something, something, if you can- That's a good question, out. that's a good question. So um, there's, there's, there's several ways that we think about this benchmarking. So we just, um, there's a paper under review right now, at least from the machine learning side, but uh, it kind of gets at the same sort of point. Um, what is the point of propagation? So uh, whenever we did these, originally did these cosine-based metrics of similarity, like this, the, the, the alignment and the, the, the scoring, um, it was not really meant to, it was meant to find high scoring candidates, right? High putative candidates. And so that's sort of a retrieval task. So that's one of the things you can do. You can ask the question, given uh, this sort of algorithmic scoring, does it retrieve, if you do this leave one out kind of idea, does it retrieve the most similar putative structure, right? You can, you can frame it in that way. So that's one of the benchmarks that we, we posit. We're like, okay, we should benchmark in this way. Another one is about prediction of structural similarity. So uh, cosine fails miserably at that because it's not designed as a regression task to say, hey, this is the sim this is how it's actually like 0 0.9 tandy modal similarity or some sort of chemical similarity. But these are two style of metrics that uh, we put into this paper, just kind of building that sort of suite. Again, it's more meant for machine learning, but we can reflect that back and talk about it from a, uh, any sort of scoring scheme. Uh, so we're, it's coming out. We, we did curate this. There's a test data set and some code behind it. So you can, you can, we can evaluate this. Um, but additionally, what we're thinking about here is um, what you really kind of care about in terms of this propagation is solving structures, not just prioritizing it, right? So with the Modi finder thing, the way we've been uh, evaluating the propagation is uh, you have this choice of this modification occurring anywhere on any atom uh, on the original molecule. And so what we predict there is a probability or likelihood distribution across all these atoms. And so we have a, a metric in, in our paper that posits, again, we're not sure it's the best way to do it, but one of the, the most naive ways is, is the highest likelihood prediction the true site of where the modification is. It turns out our algorithm and a lot of the other algorithms that we or approaches we tried, it doesn't do super great at that, so it gives us very little resolution. So instead, what we think about is, and there might not be enough information in the tandem mass spectrum, you know, in general to do this. So instead, what we did is we asked the question, given your prediction, okay, how, how correct is it? Is if you predict like this region of the molecule is the correct site in that region? And at the same time, how focal is your prediction, right? So if you predict it happening on every atom on the, of the molecule, that's like no information to anybody, right? That's just a like random guess. So it's like, you need to be very precise and you need to be very accurate. So we developed a scoring scheme um, to evaluate these things. And we have the benchmark set for that particular computational problem. Uh, so those are two ways for two different, or three ways, I guess, for two different kinds of computational formulations uh, that may be reasonable. Does that sort of answer your question, Carlos? Yes, uh, kind of. So, so my idea was more or less like checking how, how much would it, like that's why the benchmarking, how much would it compare to CMUs, for example? Not, not, not like uh, on, on, on terms of the structure, but of the CMUs 
uh, the fingerprint vectors, which is the thing that I right, have. Right, exactly. Yeah, the, the, the CSMERD. So that's a good question. Um, we actually have not done that. One of the, um, we did it with other tools from the prediction side. So we benchmarked CFMID for the site localization problem. And it turns out it does very badly. But it's so, um, again, it's in, it's in our paper about it. But one of the weaknesses of Sirius that might affect this is whenever it predicts fingerprints, the fingerprints are lossy. Um, so it, that, that's one thing that it might not be so good at. Um, but that's that's a that's a re reasonable question um, that probably should be explored. Hey, Alex, just one second. Uh, so it's it's eight past one, and uh, if I wanted to ask Ming if you is okay with continuing, um, otherwise we can end and we can have a separate discussion. Are, are you okay, uh, Ming? Yeah, no, I'm I'm good. Okay. I'm good on okay. a few more minutes at least. All right, good, Alex. Yeah. Great talk. And I'm sure this is in your paper, but how do you deal with the challenge of different collision energy and and the mass spectra being different in that manner? And can these tools handle lower resolution mass spec data or right. is it only right. high resolution mass spec data that can be used? Right. So if we're talking about it's just back in the day when we think about like molecular networking. So let's, okay, let's take a different instrument conditions, number one. So for molecular networking, a lot of how people are using these things is it's within the context of one particular data set. So if we're talking about different energies, different resolutions, generally that doesn't come into play because you're collecting it within one sort of experimental condition and organizing it. But once you start thinking about scaling up to this repository analysis, that, that makes a big difference. And so what we see there is different instruments because every energy is not exactly the same. Even you know if it's twenty eV on thermo versus you know QTOF or whatever, um, they're not the same. And so what happens is they they generally start self segregating. So you see islands of Agilent data, Bruker data, and different energies. And obviously the other side of this is different adducts and polarities. They self segregate. And so when we talk about propagating annotations, it's always in the context of that local neighborhood. Um, and so we didn't explicitly do it, but when we kind of Anecdotally, we're was looking we're looking at this. They they do start self segregating. Now, uh, that's not super ideal if you're doing an analysis and you want it. You want to propagate molecules. You don't really care about spectra, right? You're like that's that's more of a mass spectrometry artifact. And so one of the ways that we went about this in a few years ago is there's this idea of ion ion identity molecular networking. And so it tries to account for these adducts. It does some co coalition analysis and says, we think these are part of the same adduct set. Let's collapse them and then you know, simplify the network as molecules um, driven. And the connections are driven by the underlying tandem aspect, but it, it tries to mask that sort of, uh, uh, that, that sort of com artifact complexity from the mass spectrometry site. So by, well, if we... And also from a high res, low res perspective, it definitely does work. Molecular networking, we originally started, it was all an ion trap, 0 0.5 Dalton mass accuracy. So it definitely does work. But the problem is once you start scaling up, you're going to get alignments that are false positive. So you have to ask the question, how much information is in the peak masses and how much information is in the, in the, in the intensities? So that's not a study that we've done Super in detail, kind of, it's an information theory question. What if you fuzz the low res or the high res? What is this hits the sensitivity and recall? Um, so it's 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 an interesting question, um, but everybody's moving to high res anyway. So it's like, well, who cares? Um, but it, it's more of an important question, I think, from the math side, um, because when we do these fast queries um, on our side, we do indexing to make it really, really fast. And we do down sample. Uh, and quantize the data into what level of quantization uh, matters. That's something that uh, we definitely should explore. It's like semi high res right now. It's like 0 0.05 Daltons. So, um, but then one of the, the thoughts is you can always go back and refine these things and do it. It's a first pass to hit all this public data. Once you have a few thousand hits, you can just go back and get the, the full data and verify. There's, you know, we have tools for all of this as well. So. Those are those are kinds of ideas, but it's a good question. It's a good question. The heterogeneity of the data uh, it kills. At least right now, what we want to think about 
is, and we're doing this right now, is we have all this data sitting on solid state drives that we can churn through really, really fast. And just ask the question, what is the resolution, right? What should we expect the resolution to be um, given the instrument parameters? And at least should you treat them differently? Now, the implications of treat, treat, using the wrong parameters, that's, a, that's a, a, another area we could study. So it's a good question. It's always like, we don't know. So sorry, it's, it's always like that, but. Yeah. So I can ask my question later. There is a question in the chat, uh, which is basically about uh, uh, resources for undergrads to learn molecular networking and mass spec analyses. Uh, right, right. So that's great. We actually have a, a huge amount of YouTube and tutorial series um, that are published. So during the pandemic, especially, um, we were doing like a weekly seminar series on how to use GMPS. There's like 12 to 15 modules. Definitely check those out. Um, if you Google like GMPS tutorial videos or go to YouTube, they're relatively easy to find. Um, I will say these days, we are migrating a lot of the users to a GMPS2 platform hosted at UC Riverside um, that we think is nicer and that we're actually maintaining. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a... It's a, I think it's a nice user interface, but I think from an accessibility perspective, definitely we do have a lot of undergrads using it already. Um, it's become part of some undergraduate chemistry, analytical chemistry curricula. And so we teach a lot of classes um, on this. It's like, here's how you visualize uh, uh, untargeted metabolomics data. So that may be a good place to start actually. Look up the Google like GMPS dashboard. There was a Nature Methods paper that uh, we published a couple of years ago, but the bottom line is, you can visualize you know, entire tandem mass spectrometry, or it doesn't have to be tandem, but untargeted metabolomics run all in your browser, no data downloads, no none of this stuff. And so one of the classes that we teach is at um, a undergraduate institution here in Point Loma, Nazarene University with uh, Catherine Maloney. And the funny thing is it's like a class of 30. And just to illustrate kind of the, the portability of it all, they go to a linguistics computer lab. So they definitely don't have any vendor software. You can't install anything, but you can just pass along uh, a URL uh, for the data. It all appears, you can synchronize, and it's kind of like Google Docs. You can synchronize the exploration um, of, it, of it all. And then the students can just zoom around uh, and look at whatever data they want to in the mass spectrometry run. And that's a very good way to at least introduce uh, mass, untargeted mass spec and raw data inspection without having to go through all these hurdles of like having virtual machines and install thermal vendor software. This is gonna be platform agnostic. So that, that may be a good, really good place to start um, just to bring it, trickle it down, but also happy to have undergraduates use GMPS as well so they don't have to install anything. And I might add that there are a lot of resources, protocols, YouTube videos from MZ Mind, for example, on how to process the data or, or the GNPS even, and uh, uh, tutorial notes, et cetera, that probably need, need to be compiled in one spot for you know people who are just getting into this field of computation mass spectrometry to, to know what, on how to do these analyses. Uh, no, that's a good point. I think... We threw it all up. It's it's but like tying it back again. It's it's a good like Saturday afternoon exercise for me at least. So or or an under, undergrad project. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, the funny with undergrad. I mean, they're so, some of them are super great, right? Uh, but they don't know, and it's yeah, the same kind of the blind leading the blind. So maybe that's not. Uh, at least I can give a little guidance. But I think it's a good idea. It's definitely a good idea. So, so Liz has a question about the GNPS logo. Okay, so there's the, the logo that you saw. It's actually, there's a new, there's, we have a new lab logo, but that was an interim lab, lo lab logo. There's a little squirrel that you see. It's super cute um, with the, like a GMPS network thing. And well, Liz knows the answer. That's why she's asking, but I will say this. So that was originally the, it's still the logo for the MassQL. Uh, oh, you don't know though. I thought you knew the story. Okay. so. This is for MassQL when we originally started it like in 2022 or something like that. And I went over, I, I got somebody on the internet to, to make me a logo because I'm not very good at graphical design. They had a little squirrel for whatever reason. And um, I don't know, I told them. And one of the reasons is 
MassQL, if you say it really fast, you can kind of get it to be like mass squirrel or some one of the uh, staff research associates in a lab was saying it like that. And so we're like, well, that'd be fun to be a squirrel. And so they made a cute squirrel and I liked it and I'm using it as just kind of an eye catching thing. So, uh, you, know, you know, it's one of those small things. All right. If there are, are there any more questions? It's it's one seventeen, so I think we should stop at this point. Thanks a lot, Ming, uh, and thank you everyone for attending this seminar. And see you next time. Thank Take you. Care.